Romans 8, 31 and 32. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? On the first Christmas, we see the angels singing and man rejoicing, but the Father is silent. There's a reason why God was silent, not only at the birth of Jesus, but really until Christ at his baptism, God the Father did not speak forth, but then he did speak forth and say, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. But we find an Old Testament type of this in Genesis chapter 22. The New Testament is in the Old concealed. The Old is in the New revealed. We've heard it said. And here we see the story of a 100-year-old man and a miracle son. And this son was his eternal hope for the promise of God would come through him. And yet he was the promise of God. We see him as he's commanded of God to take his son, his only son, to Mount Moriah and there to offer him up as a sacrifice. What a jolt this must have come to, that must have come to the father's heart when he was told of God to do it. But Abraham is known as a man of faith and faith means obey and trust. And that's exactly what he prepared to do. He got a beast of burden, put the wood upon it. He hung a pot of fire at his side, which was the custom of the day. He put the knife in its scabbard and took his son by the hand and some servants with them, and they went to the land of Moriah. God had not said any other mountain. It was Mount Moriah, and Abraham didn't understand, but he did know how to obey. On the way, I can see that there would be questions in his heart. Why, God? I don't understand. My son was the promise. Through him, I was to be the father of many generations. Why? And yet Abraham knew that there must be a substitute for sin. There's a possibility that it crossed his mind. Maybe my son is the seed of woman's womb that would bruise, uh, bruise rather the head of the serpent. Maybe my son Isaac is that one and I'll become the father of spiritual children this way. I don't know whether he knew that much or not, but surely he was asking why, for all minds would do so especially, one that would love so much his own son, that he had waited so long for, and yet he knew it was from God the Son had come. He had a dilemma. He had to obey God. At the foot of Mount Moriah, we see him stopping the servants from continuing onward, and he takes the wood and his son and goes up the hill, and the son turns to him and he says, Father, here's the wood and the fire, but where is the sacrifice? Must have gone like a dagger to that father's heart. But we see the man of faith rising to the occasion to express his faith in God, Jehovah Jireh. God will provide himself a sacrifice, he said in faith. He put him on the altar after it was constructed. And there bound Isaac was laying in the place of one who would be the sacrifice. And Abraham took the dagger over him and in obedience started to plunge it when God said, wait. Now I know. Now I know that your heart is committed first to me, God says in verse 12, Genesis 22. He says, take the ram and offer him up 
instead. I'll provide myself a sacrifice, God was saying. According to 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1, Mount Moriah and Mount Zion are the same place. Mount Zion is the place where the city of Jerusalem is built. It's the place where the Holy of Holies was to be someday. Abraham didn't know why, but God said Mount Moriah, he obeyed. But it was on the same mount that Jesus was to be offered as a sacrifice thousands of years later. For Mount Zion, the extension of Mount Zion was also Mount Calvary. Though it was excavated apart a few hundred feet, still it is the place, the place of the skull, is the same part of the same is part of the same mountain where Isaac started to be offered up as a sacrifice. God was saying, No, Abraham, no man can die for his sins. It's got to be my son, not yours. He took our place. That's what it means, a substitution. He that spared not his own son, but no one could take Jesus' place. We were on that altar of death, and the knife was over us, and God said, wait. You don't have to die. I have a substitute to be in your place. But when God realized all of this would take place, and he was sending his son to die while angels are singing and rejoicing with man for man's redemption would be through that son. The, silent is father, the father is silent and he has a turned solemn face. I don't think he's looking on joy. He knows the price. He knows the cost that is that he is paying, and that his son will pay. For resurrection will never erase the scars of Jesus. An eternity will not take away the scars of Jesus. He who is the most beautiful of all creation, and above all creation, for he wasn't even created, the beauties, the glories of heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, was marred more than any other creature, the Bible tells us. And yet this marred one will be the most beautiful, though the scars will still be there throughout all of heaven. We move so quickly from the crib to the throne, but we need to stop. Stop at the cross and consider God's love. He that loved so much that he spared not his own son. And he did it for you and me. What is the atonement? The atonement is the substitution that God has offered for us for our salvation. One thing about the atonement, we don't have to understand all of the technicalities of it to find salvation through Jesus. But I believe that we should discover the truths of the atonement in order to appreciate more fully the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. For every time we take communion, we are remembering the Lord's death until he comes again. There's a story that is told of a czar a long time ago when the place over which he ruled was not very large and communication was rather complete in that day from mouth to mouth. The czar had passed a law, but his own mother was one of those that broke his law first. Now, law to be law has to have consequence. And he'd put in the consequence, and that was of a public beating for those that would break the law. And whenever the word came to him that his own mother had broken the law, 
This, of course, broke the heart of the czar, but now he had a dilemma. He was the governor over the area. What was he going to do? If he allowed his mother to get away with it, his law would be no good from that moment on. He loved his mother, but he had to love his law, or he couldn't be governor. And so, to be just, he called for his mother to be, called, to be brought to the center of that town, to the whipping post. And there the man stood with the whip and the crowds gathered round. And it was an awesome day for everyone as they awaited to see what would happen. When the czar stepped forward, he bared his own back and he had the man with the whip lay it on him as he stood between his mother and the public executioner. This is taking the place of another. This is substitution. Now the atonement is the means and condition for securing reconciliation between God and man the atonement, the means and condition for securing reconciliation between God and man. We can pray for the salvation of a sinner, but you can't pray for atonement. It's already provided. This in the foreknowledge of God has been ordained from before the foundations of the earth in Jesus. Atonement is God's provision, the means and the conditions for securing this reconciliation between God and man. Now there has to be a balance of justice and mercy for this to ever occur. God is just, he's also merciful. Any man of international law, be he a judge, for example, at The Hague, the international courts, or be he a lawyer that appears before that court, every one of them have a dilemma when it comes to bringing together mercy and justice. You can't do it. Not absolutely as a man. Now, for example, if someone breaks the law here in this country, the authorities have a dilemma every time. How much mercy do you show the man and how much justice? If you show too much mercy, what happens to the law? If a man commits a murder and he comes before the judge and the judge slaps him on the hand and says, now don't do that anymore, that law is not going to be worth anything. Pretty soon everyone's going to be killing and saying, well, I'll take that slap, thank you, and get rid of him. You see, too much mercy does not allow justice to be. However, if one is too just, the hanging judge type uh, image, pretty soon there's no mercy, there's no milk of human kindness. And that's not good government either. But how do you find the perfect balance? Perhaps this will help you. Remember this concept of both, for both must be there. A woman once came in to a photographer. She had her picture taken and came back to see the proofs. He showed her the proofs and she looked at them and she said, that doesn't do me justice. He looked at her and he said, lady, you don't need justice, you need mercy. <laughs> Now this area of mercy and justice is no light matter. It's a huge area to consider. You watch the nations that begin to swing too much toward mercy toward the individual and then crime becomes rampant in the land. The beauty of this nation here is they keep justice high. It may be tough on the criminal but everyone wants to live in this society. 
and they have to have strict laws to keep them out. Now, the definition of mercy is an effort to pardon or procure a pardon unless the attribute of wisdom prevent it. Mercy. An effort to pardon or procure a pardon unless the attribute of wisdom prevent it. This is the mercy of God. To put it in another way, it's not to get what you deserve. Not to get what you deserve. Justice. Justice exhibited in the execution of the penalties of the law. If you don't execute the penalties of the law, then justice is not done. And in the support of public order. Again, if you do not have justice regarding the criminal, pretty soon there will be no public order. It'll be chaos, anarchy. In the streets, they'll break into the store windows and get what they want when there's no justice. And in various other ways, for the well-being of mankind generally, justice looks out for the good of the total group, the unity. Mercy is usually for the individual, although you can have mercy as a nation as well. But these two come together in the cross of Jesus Christ. Justice and mercy form the cross. And God has the two absolutely in Jesus Christ on the cross. The concepts of the cross and of atonement is tremendous. But there are five things that, at least, that must be answered before the atonement can be dispersed righteously from God. Five areas. We'll list them here on the board so that it will help you. But you see, God is a just governor of the universe. He's provided laws, and therefore there must be consequences for those laws. But if he's going to set aside the, the penalty of the law for the sinner through the cross, and that's what the whole uh, love of God was proposing on the cross, that he set aside our penalty for breaking the law. First of all, the honor of the law must be upheld. You see, the law of God was motivated by God's love. It's the limits of God's love. When he says, thou shalt do no murder, it's not only good for the innocent one that's about to get murdered, but it's good for you too not to murder. For it'll destroy you. You weren't created to be a lawbreaker. And the law is to be upheld. There must be an honor in that law. It must be appreciated. David said, oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it day and night. He found that it was life. He found that it taught him to be wiser even than his teachers as he meditated on the law of God. Now you consider what that law means. That's the word of God that backs up man and tells man what to do. The moral law of God written on his heart. The written word of God in the in the Bible. And the honor of this law must be upheld. Secondly, the welfare of the community must be considered. Thirdly, there must be a proper impression as regards the evil of sin as revealed by law. The evil of sin must be revealed properly in whatever God's way would be that he would choose that man could be saved. It must show that sin is really evil. Notice the cross is to do all of this. 
got to uphold the law. It's got to consider the welfare of the community at large. It's got to show how awful sin is. It must also include the reformation and future good conduct of him who is pardoned. So, it must change the sinner. And the fifth, as a fair representation of the lawgiver, it must show him as his character is good as far as the atonement may bear on it. So it must show God, God's character as it is. Any type of atonement or provision of God that wouldn't show God's character as it is would not be sufficient as a means of salvation. Now, you may add more to this, but let's consider these for just a moment. The honor of the law upheld. The law is good. The welfare of the community, for God is, con is concerned over the total. That's his responsibility. Sin must be shown to be as evil as it is by whatever way God chooses. And the sinner's future conduct must also be assured that there's a true change in his character and in his commitments. And God's character must be shown as it is. There was a king in a part now of Europe called Italy, but prior to this nation's formation. A king by the name of King Zaluka. King Zaluka had a small little kingdom around himself and he passed a law and it had to do with adultery and he recognized what was happening in the communities in his land that as adultery took place the, the place took on more strife and people were starting to kill one another and other things took place. So he passed a very strict law on adultery. And he said that anyone caught in adultery would have their eyes put out. We may consider that too harsh, but in those days, law was very harsh as far as the consequences were concerned. But adultery stopped almost entirely. So one day his own son was caught in adultery. He had the honor of his law to uphold. Did he love his law? Was it good for the total community or not? Was the sin really bad? Was it evil? What would he do? He called for his son to come in. They brought him in. And he took the hot poker that they used to put out the eyes and he put one of the son's eye out and then he had them put one of his eyes out. Now obviously there was not the loss of sight but something was done in that kingdom where the honor was upheld. Everyone said, you better not break the law. He even judged his own son and took part of it himself. He was concerned about the community and everyone were willing to live better after that. Also, they could see the evil of the sin and how the king felt about the sin. And the son himself was a changed man after that. When he saw his father's view of the sin that he had committed, but it also upheld the character of the man. They knew he was just, even though he was able to extend mercy to his son in such a way. Many views of the cross don't always show these areas. 
For example, the reformation and future good conduct of the one that is pardoned, the sinner's change, isn't always necessary in some views. But it's like a parole. When a man comes up out of prison to the parole board, they want to know three things. The first thing they'll ask him, are you guilty? Are you guilty of the crime for which you were charged? If he says, no, I wasn't, I was framed. I'm innocent. They say, go back to prison. The courts proved you guilty. You see, they can't parole a man until he not only is in prison because of the crime, but he admits his guilt for the crime. Parole can't be extended otherwise. Uh, he can serve out his sentence and still come out claiming his innocence, but he can't get parole. Secondly, if he says, yes, I was guilty, the second thing they want to find out, are you sorry? Now, they'll ask it in different ways, but that's really what they're getting at. Now, if he says, listen, that guy had it coming, back to prison he goes. Now, the third area they want to know is, are you going to do it again? Would you do it again if you had it to do over? Well, yes, I would. I did it. I'm sorry, but I'm going to do it again if I get a chance. He's not going to get a chance. He goes back. You see, God looks at sin as being an awful thing. All you have to do is look at the cross. And you'll see God's view of sin. It's horrible. And God wants change sinners. He doesn't want some sort of a technical salvation. So if the cross can't change a sinner, then God has failed in the cross. Do you see the indictment that some teaching has against the cross of Christ? It must change the sinner. And if there's no power to change the sinner, there's no power in the cross. What are we talking about when we sing power in the blood? Also in the area of God's character. How does the view of the cross show God's character? Is God a vindictive God? Who squeezes out every ounce of suffering necessary in order to pay for the exact amount of sin and penalty? Is it a God who is just and he's full of wrath and the cross changes God from a God of wrath to a God of love? I've heard that. That's why the little girl in Sunday school said, I don't like God, but I love Jesus. You see, because the view is, is God in, in his anger and wrath is coming down upon man, but Jesus in his love slips between the two and saves us. The Bible doesn't say God so hated the world that he was going to destroy it. It says God so loved the world. It's the love of God. And any view that shows God in that picture is not fair in its representation over the Creator God and the Lawgiver God. No wonder people are turned off to the cross and turned off to God. He's not shown as He is properly with such a view as that. No, our God is a God of love. And that's why there is a cross. There are many theories of the atonement, 12 major theories of the atonement, but there are three that are better known than any other. These three will just discuss briefly and again say, as a way of emphasis, that it's not your theory that will save you, it's Jesus. And you may not understand it all, but you can still be saved. But there are three. The first one that I'll mention is the limited view of the atonement. Now, the limited view of the atonement simply says that the, the atonement was a literal or exact payment for sin. 
All right, an exact, literal payment. For sin. Now, they note in the limited view of the atonement that in this literal, exact payment of sin, all are not being saved. Since all are not being saved, therefore, that's what these three dots mean, therefore, Christ did not die for all, or we would say not, the atonement was not made for all. So we call it the limited view. Christ died only for the elect because he paid the exact literal payment for sin. Now it's in a commercial sense that Christ bought our salvation by taking the penalties exactly as I've had it described to me. It means that in a dollar for dollar sense, if you send a million dollars worth, Christ had to suffer a million dollars for you plus whatever amount for everyone else, dollar for dollar. Now because he was infinite, it is argued, therefore just a moment times infinite time equals whatever the total was. Exactly. An exact literal payment. So the sinner says, aha, uh -huh. God's just like I am. He's vindictive. He'll get back if he can to the very last dollar. Now that doesn't give a good view of God. But we got some other problems. Did Christ only die for a few? Another view is called the universal view, universalism. It begins with the same premise. That the atonement was an exact literal payment for sin. But what they observe is that Christ died for all. And if Christ died for all, the argument would ob obviously follow, if the premise is right, all will be saved. And so we have the view called in universalism where everyone universally will ultimately be saved because Christ paid the exact literal payment for all sins. And if he did this, well naturally, what you go out to buy, you're going to get goes the argument, and Christ paid the total price for everyone's sin, so ultimately it's just a matter of bringing them to that. Universalism. The third view, which is more widely spread in evangelical circles, is called the general view of the atonement. Now the general view doesn't begin with the same premise. But it begins with the scripture as stated in Isaiah 53, 6. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Okay, so it begins with Christ died for all. And I believe that you should begin all of your theories right from the Word of God. So it's better to take it. And here we'll put down Isaiah 53, 6. Christ died for all. But they observe all 
are not being saved. Jesus said it's a broad road that leads to destruction. All are not being saved. Many are being lost. Genesis chapter 6, 5 through 8, we see that God is disgusted. He repented that he even made man because of the directions of men. And yet, Christ died for all. Therefore, it's not an exact literal payment. So when we speak of Christ purchasing us, purchasing or buying our salvation, we're not talking about it in a, in a literal or a commercial sense. No more than an insurance company would come to a mother whose child has been killed and yet insured would say, well, we just bought your child for $10,000. Do you get the impact of that? There's a personal price that no money or commercial sense or an exact payment view can ever, can ever come up to. It's a personal price. Jesus personally died. It's not the amount of blood that dropped. It's that it was all of his blood. It's not that he gave a certain amount of suffering. He just suffered totally. It's the personal concept because it's a personal relationship that's been broken. It's a personal sacrifice, personal suffering to totality of the individual in the Lord Jesus Christ that we see here that is buying our sin, but not buying, our, rather, our salvation. You're bought by His blood, but it's in the personal sense, not a commercial or exact payment sense. And that's an important area to understand. You see, when a, an insurance company would come, they may say, we will give you so much, what, but what's it about? It has to do with public justice to s satisfy the irresponsible action of whoever it was that killed the child. But secondly, it's also to provide for the practical needs of the person, but it never makes up for the life of the individual. There is no such price. And nothing, no price can be put upon our dear master's head. It's a personal price. It cost him all. It also was a personal price for God. It cost him all. I believe it was harder for the father to give the son than the son to die. Being a father, I would know this. The cost was greater for the father to give the son than we can ever compare. We must not put a price on Jesus. And some views do. Now, Christ fulfilled all the conditions necessary for the reconciliation between God and man. You see, God was right and man was wrong. And how do you bring a rebel, even with another rebel, to reconciliation? How is it possible? If two have rebelled against one another, somebody's got to humble themselves first. But God's problem is that he didn't rebel. He didn't do anything wrong. But man did. Now, how does he humble man? Because outside of humbling, reconciliation can't occur. When two individuals have offended one another, you've got a problem. But when one is really right and the other one is wrong through pride, now you've got a greater problem. If God could say, I was wrong, he's humble enough to do so, but he couldn't say it because it wouldn't be true. And yet man is in pride, rebelling against God. So how does God get man to repent and quit rebelling and humble himself, which is the opposite of what he's chosen? Outside of the cross, you'll not find an answer, for God must have looked for one before he ever start, uh, decided on such an awesome event as the cross. Jesus on the cross fulfilled all the conditions necessary. He upheld the honor of the law by taking on himself the penalty of it. The penalty in the sense that he satisfied public justice completely. 
No one would ask for more than the King of Kings to die for the creation that he had created. Not necessary exact literal payment. Just look who he is. He died. That's all that's necessary. It upholds the honor of any law. It also takes our penalty, our place. He took our place. Secondly, the welfare of the community is considered because by the weight of God's love evidenced in the cross, the community not only sees the love and mercy of God, they still see how just God is that he would give his only begotten son to take their place. So the welfare of the community is still considered by God. No one's going to go around the world saying, you can live like you want to. God doesn't care when you see the cross as it really was. And this idea of sinning all the time in the view of the cross must be disgusting to God when you see the price that God paid. Cheap grace, easy believism, somehow have never been compared to the cross of Jesus Christ. That's awesome. Thirdly, the evil of sin is shown in the cross. When you understand that the one most beautiful is now the one most marred, that in itself shows us the evil of sin. Jesus hanging on the cross. God hanging on the cross. The creator of the universe dying in our stead. What more can we say about sin? It must be horrible in God's sight. To see the cross is to see the horrors of sin. And the future good conduct of the sinner is assured in the impact when that sinner sees the cross. When the Holy Spirit makes the sufferings of Jesus real on the cross to a sinner. And he sees the personal aspect of Jesus dying for him. All you need to do is see the cross. See it as it really happened. And that's the greatest deterrent to sin on earth above and beyond all other. It brings you to true repentance. Why? You see, God with his problem, what does he do when he's right and the sinner's wrong and the sinner is wrong on the basis of pride? God descends, born in a stable, lived in a world in which he had no rights. He gave them all up. And there dies on the cross. And he's, as he's hanging there naked, as the sinner looks at it, he's, his pride is embarrassed because of the humility of God. And it's only as his humility embarrasses us that we can come to the place of true repentance. God's character is shown there on the cross. He's a God of love. And essential to love is both justice and mercy. And all are shown in the cross. I believe that God is not vindictive. But it is God's final answer. The cross is the final provision for the sinner. And it can only occur once in history. For there to be another cross in a future creation would simply rob the cross of its value. There can only be one. I believe there's only one. And there only will be one, nor were, was there another time when there was a cross. Only one substitute in all of eternity. And it is in this way that we see that the power of the cross outweighs a million years in hell as far as a deterrent to the sin of man. If the cross doesn't work, friends, hell won't, nothing else will. Some feel like 10,000 years in hell will change it, but there's nothing as big as the cross in the life of a sinner. 
And if he rejects that, there's no other answer. God also not only provided the conditions, but he provided the means. The means is the combination of his grace and mercy. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Now this is the means for reconciliation between God and man. Jesus, in absolute innocence, died for the guilt of others in order to transfer his cleansing, or rather to transfer to us the power to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is the grace of God extended. This is the cleansing by the blood of the Lamb. And Jesus, by giving this blood on the cross, provided the means. Secondly, he overcame the power of sin in his own body. Much as when they discovered the first vaccine, they used a horse and they put into this horse this, this germ. And the horse's blood, it looked like the germ would conquer it. And the death, death of the horse seemed to be in, imminent. But instead, the strength in the blood of that horse overwhelmed and overcame that vaccine. I believe it was smallpox. I've forgotten for sure. But whatever it was, then it overcame that, and they could take the serum out of the horse's blood and give it to man, and he was immune to the sin. Jesus, in his own body, took the sins of the world upon himself, and he overcame the sin in his own innocence through the power of the Holy Spirit. And next we see that he was raised from the dead by this Holy Spirit, and the same Spirit of resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ can dwell in you. Same Spirit. And it's this provision... These means that came to us all in the cross. There is nothing outside of the cross. It's the doorway to everything in God. There's no shortcut to God, no other way given on earth. There's no name under heaven even other than Jesus. He's the only way of salvation. He is the mediator between God and man. To try to bring an illustration to bear on the cross, you cannot, that will fully satisfy all that took place, obviously so. Here you have the government of God, how God rules, and He rules righteously, and He rules over all, and He has promises for the future. And He warns us of sin. Man is free, and yet man has fallen. What do you do? It's in the cross that the answers all came. There is nothing more ingenious in history or in all of eternity than God's provision for the salvation of man. And yet there's nothing more costly. No greater love has ever been shown than the love of God in the cross. But I will give an illustration. Perhaps it'll give some windows of light in the situation in a small little world in microcosm. It's a true story that took place in Kentucky, a place in the United States where in the hills of Kentucky they lived not so modern a life. And it was up in these hills that there was a community there, a farming, a small farming community where they had a one-room schoolhouse but no teacher. Now, the reason they had no teacher is they had a lot of second graders who were shaving. And these guys, 18 and 19 years of age, still back in the second grade, would beat up all the teachers that came along. And it was their ego trip to see who would get the next teacher and run them out of town first. Obviously, they're not going to get educated and out of the situation that they're presently in by such conduct but no teacher would come until a Christian heard about the situation and this man came into the community, looked up the farmer who was the head of the school board, and he said to him, he said, uh, I'm a teacher and I understand that you have no teacher in your school and I want to apply for the job. The 
farmer looked at him and put one foot up on the fence rail. He says, well, I guess I better tell you the truth about the situation. The teacher says, I've already heard. I understand that they've beaten up every teacher and nobody will come. He says, well, that's right. He says, I still want to apply. He says, it's your neck. Well, they got out the announcement. The kids came, and some of them had new overalls on. They rang that school bell, and that was a big, exciting day. And the big guys were sitting toward the back, throwing spitwads right away, punching one another and saying, he's mine. Look at that scrawny little guy. But the teacher stood up and looked around, and he said, now, we're going to consider what our purpose for school is. Is there any reason for us to be educated? What good will come of it? He started talking about purpose. They began to think about that. One suggested, well, I guess you can get a better job. Another one said, I, I think we can read books then and, and learn a lot of things. And in other words, it would open up a bigger, broader life for them, more fulfilling. They began to discuss all of the, the pros and even some of the cons of education. They decided it was worthwhile. They hadn't thought of those things before. They just thought you had to be educated because the law said so. Then the teacher began to talk on another line. He says, you know, in order to gain these goals, we've got to learn to get, live together. They thought, uh-oh, here we go. Rules. They were right. He said, we've got to have some rules. But I'm not going to make them. You are. Now, this teacher knew something. He knew that on the, uh, the heart of every person is a moral law. And prior to the crime, everybody can get out good law. There's no problem then. It's after the guilt that you got a problem coming up with the law. Because then people will try to fix it from a selfish basis. So he was starting out the beginning right, and he said, all right, we're going to make the rules, you make them. First of all, uh, whatever you want, we'll put on the blackboard, and that'll become the rule if you all agree to it. This was pretty exciting. So after uh, a while, one raised his hand, and he says, teacher, I don't think we ought to have fights. Now, this is a scrawny little guy. He was thinking ahead. <laughs> he knew what it was to have a sore nose. Well, no one had fought yet. It's a brand new school, as far as they were concerned now. They agreed, all right, no fights. Nobody's mad at anyone. Why couldn't they agree to that? That was a just rule. Another boy raised his hand. He said, I don't think we ought to cheat on tests. He was the egghead. He knew the answers always, and he hated somebody else without studying, getting his answers. They all agreed that was fair, went on the board. Another one raised his hand, a chubby little fellow, and he says, I don't think we ought to steal lunches, teacher. Thinking ahead. And he had lost some of his mom's good cooking that way, and he didn't want to do with that anymore. Everybody agreed that was fair, and they wrote it on the board. They went on down making a list of 10 or 12 rules. And finally, the teacher looked it over and saw that it covered just literally every area that was necessary to carry school on. And then the teacher said, well, you know, these still, <laughs> these aren't rules. They said, what do you mean? What happens if somebody breaks the rule? There's no provision for that. See, no consequence is only advice. <laughs> Yeah, right away, the chubby boy thought, yeah, they'll take my lunch, and so what? <laughs> so they decided on consequence. They discussed it a while and finally ended up that they felt like that publicly the guy ought to have to come up and bare his back and have so many whippings across the back with a belt. And they appointed a sergeant at arms to do the job, who was a big guy. And they numbered the amount for the crime. That school went along beautifully. They had no problems. 
But many weeks later, when everyone was so happy with their rules, suddenly a young boy came to this teacher and said, somebody took my lunch, teacher. Oh, no, I'm sure that that didn't happen. Yes, it did. Somebody took my lunch. It's gone. Well, the teacher was convinced, finally, and the teacher came before the crowd and said, the lunch has been stolen. Now, it would be better for you to go ahead and admit it because we'll find out one way or another, and it's easier to admit it yourself. It's a long silence, and finally a little boy raised his hand, Johnny, in the back. He said, I took it, Johnny. I took it, teacher. He was the poorest boy in the community. He had no father. He was in rags. He said, but teacher, I hadn't eaten in three days now, and I was hungry. Now the teacher had a dilemma. He would either uphold the law or else the rules wouldn't be any good and the, the school would be destroyed. He said, come on up, Johnny. You know the rules. Sergeant at arms came up and he said, don't make it. But Johnny said, don't make me take off my coat. And they said, that's the rule too. He took it off. And instead of having a shirt, he didn't even have a shirt, just the ragged coat over his bare body. And he stood there barebacked. And a boy stood at the back, Jim, a big fellow. And he said, wait a minute, teacher. He says, is there anything in the rules that says we can't take somebody else's place? The teacher said, no, we didn't discuss that. He said, I'd like to take Johnny's place. He said, all right, if everyone else agrees, it's all right with me. Jim came up and took his place. And over the back of Jim went those stripes. And everyone was in tears, including the teacher, standing in the corner. But after they all looked up, there was Johnny and Jim hugging each other. And Johnny saying, I'll never do that again. Thank you. Thank you for taking my place. But I'm sorry. I'll never do it if I starve to death. Jesus took our place. And when we see him in our place, realizing it was us that should be there, we take a different view of sin, a different view of God, a different view of this world. In closing, I just read Isaiah 53. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He had no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief and like one from whom men hide their face. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he bore himself and our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquity. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, Yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away and as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. His grave was assigned to be with wicked men yet with the rich in man in his death. Although he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth, but the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors.
Thank you, Lord, for such a wonderful salvation through the cross of Christ. Amen.